Welcome to the new Transmedia Factual Programming Experiences. Um, my name is Jason DePonte, and I'm going to be the moderator for this panel. Um, I'm a Transmedia producer myself, um, and you're going to be seeing one of the projects that I'm working on at the moment um, in the case studies. But our main speakers today are Asta Velias from Denmark, who uh, worked with the Zentropa company that she founded and co-owned with Lars von Trier for 12 years, creating all forms of interactive experiences across all forms of devices, working largely with fictional content. And Anna Lundmark from Boost in Sweden, who <coughs> Boost is a talent development program that she's going to tell you more about, but she also has 15 years of documentary making film experience. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Asta, who is going to take you through a number of case studies, and then we'll have discussion uh, with Anna at the end. Thank you. As Jameson said, I started out in Centropa doing all kind of interactive stuff for around 12 years. Then I started moving into museums because they were actually faster than films to picking out new ways of doing format. So both virtual and physical. And the last couple of years, I've been working a lot with documentaries and especially last year, media funded, we had a project with interactive documentaries from all around the world where we selected from about 40, 50 projects then we had one kind of development phase in Canada with international experts with these 22 projects. And then at Film Contact North and a Nordic Festival, we had a finances forum. So we followed them from ideas and down to how does the finance actually react. So what I'm going to show you is some of the things I'm working on right now, but also what I see of tendencies. And, uh, you could say transmedia and docs. Why is this interesting? I'm going to show you five case studies. And I, uh, what did you say? I made a joke on Jason because I actually wanted one of his projects as a case study. So the moderator also have to tell you a little bit. And then we've been working with some creative paradigms because we can see that we have to invent and develop in another way than we used to. And if you think about it, any creative development been made on the earlier format. So when we suddenly have a film, it actually takes us 10 years to find out this is not 3D like theater. We have to use the camera differently. Whenever we develop, we develop with the prior format. And that's kind of the curse of convergence. And trying to break that, we have to come up with new ways of developing. And we're just starting that work in Scandinavia. Me and Anna are trying to actually gather funding right now and are quite lucky it looks like it to put together international people and say, how can we do new ways of doing this so we don't keep wasting the same money all around the world? So that's basically it. My slides are not very designed and beautiful. It's the case works that's interesting because Lars von Trier and Dogma and actually the idea and what works, that's my background. Uh, so that's where I come from. Well, I actually want to ask you first, why is documentary and transmedia interesting? And I know there's a very talented producer right there. I'm going to pick on her later. So I want to ask over there, why is it interesting? Because it's natural. It's in the story. We follow real people, and real people engage other real people to see them. That, that relationship is important. I think it's just a natural marriage. It's, it's always the same thing. It's a really development. Of it. it's, it's a development. It's a really natural development from documentary to transmedia. And you say it's because of the relationship, because the relationship is real? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's one point. I, I agree with you, but there's a, and over there we have someone? Or were you just scratching your head? You were scratching your head. Someone else, why is documentary and transmedia interesting? What's an interesting combo? Why are you here? <laughs> Nobody wants to add anything? Yeah, you do. It's just so like interesting. My son likes it. Yeah, your son likes it, so you see it's being used. It's so interesting because I was working with Swiss television, developing format, uh, television formats, and we were talking about that we will lose a generation. We forget that we had to learn to watch TV. People will, at a certain point, a certain group will not do it. You have to engage them otherwise. And we have to learn the new ways of doing cultural communication. Actually, what is happening is return to another way of doing cultural stimuli, if you kind of say it on a bit more uh, academic level. But basically, it's just new ways of communication. We are still telling stories. We're just doing it on another format. 
And we have to take that format in because else we're going to lose generations. So I would say, um, for me, it's very much about what documentary wants. I come from the fiction world, but I also come from working with directors who wanted to change the world. And for me, a documentary is saying, I need you to look at this right now because it's really important. And to me, documentary is about saying, look here, I need your attention, and then I really hope you do something about it. So for me, somehow, transmedia, which is about engaging, getting people to do things, interactive, and then the documentary is saying, we do this for a reason. This needs to have an effect more than just entertain. That, for me, is a perfect match. I've been doing a lot of archive... Oh. Yeah, first of all, transmedia. Very good question. We now have about four, four words describing it. Transmedia is most often a project that has more components. That means it can be more formats, for example, a film, a, a game, an app. But for me, it actually means that it has elements that are interactive, which means the audience are led into the story. And I'll show you some case examples, because the funny thing is, there is no kind of there's a pile of academic definitions, but nobody really agrees. What we do agree on is that it has to have some kind of communication between the user and you, or that it could be a more platforms. Uh, for example, if you look at Batman, which is a very large IP, they have games, films, comics, so on. That's a multimedia project or multi-platform, but I would say for it to be transmedia, there needs to be some kind of interactivity. But again, that's very much discussed. Jason, what would you say? I would say that it's a story that plays out at different times across different platforms and has that interaction that you were talking about. So you see there are many possibilities. We can send you lots of links afterwards you like to definitions. But just to I, say... And I think it changes every year as the media changes. Yeah. That's something that we're seeing every time. Every time there's a new headline project, someone pushes the envelope further and pushes the boundaries further. And so we see how that works with the audience. And when it works, that's suddenly becoming part of the definition. Mm. But I would say either this would kind of you on different formats and platforms, so you kind of play out your story depending what works best. And the other is engaging with the audience. And you can do that in many ways. You can also kind of do fake interaction where people feel very entertained but they're not really participating. But I'll show you a couple of case studies. Um, my list, kind of why I do a lot of documentary projects right now, is actually because it's really, really expensive to do transmedia content. And with documentaries, I always have some kind of sources. I have archives, I have uh, real newspaper articles. It's easier to create content and not so expensive. And what's really important is it's linked to reality. If we do a fiction transmedia project, we run out of content and of story. And here, we can link what we want people to look at to reality. So that's really important for me. And then we have something which I would say, we can make the audience dig deeper. I see stories as a way of transferring experience and attention. But I also see stories as learning tools where we eye open on something. We are Socrates helping people giving birth to looking at the world in a new way, which means we inspire them, get them going, and then they go out and change and do things. And in transmedia, if we can get people to actually make change and kind of go deeper into the subject the theme. So for me, that's why this is very interesting. We talk about sometimes digital archaeologists, or actually the users being investigators on your part. And I'll show you a very exam an interesting example in a second. So that's for me why it's important. Now, let's go to the first case study. And again, this is one example of transmedia because there are no fixed definitions yet. This is a Swedish project I just started working on. And um, Anna actually gave the money and has talent developed them. So she'll tell you about the documentary in a second. I just want to say we have very early phases. It's a very good story, very interesting, both Swedish and international with huge audience potentials. It got some small development money and they're very much interest from TV stations and also, uh, also films institutes. We see this as potential very, very big project. Right now, we're mostly working within Sweden. Anna, story of the documentary? Yeah, is this on? Yeah. Uh, I will also tell you a little bit about the, their development process later on, mm -hmm. uh, since I've been very involved in the 
so was Asta. Um, the doc documentary is about an organization called UFO Sweden. It consists of men between 50 and 65, 70, somewhere there. They're totally nerds when it comes to UFOs. But not in the sense that they truly believe, it's more in the way of finding out uh, whether UFOs exist or not. And the leader of the pack, Klaus Swan, has done several investigations for the military in Sweden, for instance. So far, they haven't found uh, one of these cases to be you know, a true UFO phenomen phenomena. But there's one that is on Seoul that is called the Ghost Rockets. And that was in, in the, I think it was 1946 or 47, uh, there was reported a lot of cases around Sweden. And at that time we didn't have, you know, we didn't have internet, we didn't have whatever. So people wrote, you know, on telephone and stuff about these un unidentified objects, you know, landing in lakes and landing all over Sweden. Um, and what they're going to do now in the documentary is going on a secret mission to find out if they can find something in one of the lakes. Mm. And to their help, they've got an archive that the military has, you know, let, it's been public, it's made being public at the time. So, that's the documentary. That's the Ghost Runners, that's a nice website. The interesting thing is we have them following these guys who debunks professionally. And they're going into this lake to find these ghost rockets. On the other hand, we have a military archive that's just been released that might contain secrets because the military haven't had manpower enough to actually go through all the documents. The debunkers are actually scientific people, so they debunked a lot of UFO stories in Sweden, destroying beautiful myth and UFO theories, saying no, this was reflections from a lake. But the ghost rockets, they've never been able to solve. Guys, I want to run the film now. This is just a small cut of some of the material, this is a military man who had been interviewed by the debunkers. He was the one who also used to be in the investigations. Men vi kunde inte hitta ett enda metallfragment. Var inte det väldigt förbryllande? Jo, vi förstod inte hur, hur det kunde undgå att finnas. Var det någonsin någon tvekan om att något hade slagit ner? Det var aldrig någon tvekan om det. Forty-six and still not solved. Now, oh guys, let's go back to the presentation. We wait for this case study. The Transmedia project has focused on the archive because there's so much amount of material that the filmmaker can't possibly go through it, but they really want to uncover what's there. So what we're talking about is doing a very simple app. And this app has actually been made in UK where it's been used to check parliament members' bills Kind of, you know, for public, we pay for a lot of their the costs. So they made this app to make people go through and see if there's anything here. So we're actually going to copy that functionality, get people in to help. And that might be people who are crazy about UFOs. It might be people who don't believe. It might be anybody who are actually interested in going into this military archives that have been released. So we are using the people's passion and intention to help us on wheel. And we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if there's a secret down there. So it's not a fixed narrative. The documentary has its own narrative. So it's two kind of parallel narratives, but working in a bigger universe trying to solve uh, this mystery. So very interesting project. We just started. So we start looking at how can we scan the documents. We're working with two different archives, getting a lot of students to help to scan. And then we're also working with a translator tool that the audience can do themselves. Google Translate a bit more, because they're, of course, all in Swedish. And I've, we thought that as a Swedish project first, but we saw that, attention-wise, this is international, because there's so many passionate users. But Anna will say a little bit about that. So I'm going to take you to another project. 
This is commissioned by Art of France. It's going to launch September. There's going to be a documentary and a transmedia or an interactive web doc, we call it, at the same time. It's quite an interesting universe. How many here know Anna Frank's diaries? Yes. Young girl, Second World War, writing. Very strong story. Now, for some reason, they actually read Anna Frank in Japan. But it's a very different memory of Second World War from her point of view than the Japanese point of view, of course. So we're actually working with two very different world uh, views, you can say very different cultures, looking at the same huge event. And that's what the project's about. So we are actually kind of merging manga with Candy and Anna Frank. And the documentary is pretty finished. We've done some flesh out on the interactive part. I would say uh, it's documentary, uh, interactive web doc and comic book. Now, there's been a lot of projects where you play a journalist, and people actually get tired by playing a journalist. But what they would like to do is follow trails. So we are following a detective, or not a, but a kind of an investigate uh, journalist who walks around. Now, we want to show these two worlds. You, you'll see the, the kind of short thing we've done so far. But when you get interested in something in the visuals, and your mouse moves around and new things pop up, and we record that. So when you finish with this, we will have a mental map of what caught your eye. And which of these two worlds, and that there's no right or wrong, it's just us putting two different things in front of you and saying, here are two different sets of realities. Guys, let's show it. And let me just get the sound on here. It's a bit high, the sound. Hope you don't mind. So this is just a draft of the visual, and we're really working hard right now because we have a deadline in September. So here we're following him. It's going to probably be this style. Sometimes also we have archives clips that is combined. So it's something between a web doc and a comic online. I think it's really interesting. Uh, the working team was actually uh, people who were programmers. Uh, and actually make websites before, but they wanted to move into comics because they thought they had something communication-wise where we can bridge the gap. Because these two cultures, uh, we're used to manga in Europe, and they have had comics as a very strong cultural phenomena for years. So it's a very interesting format to work in. I haven't kind of done a web documentary comics before, uh, so we're having a lot of fun. We also want to put some more live animations into it. Okay, boys, I'm finished with this one. <coughs> so that's the Anna Frank. Uh, now I come to one that really close to my heart, and we haven't broken it yet. We haven't found out how to solve it. We just know that we think it's really important. Now, whenever you do this project, you really need to find out what's your goal with this transmedia, because everybody kind of goes, I want an interactive dog, I want an app, I want a Facebook plugin, and that's not what it's about. It's about what you want to do with the story, what you want with the audience. So it's never about techniques, it's about emotional experiences and your goal. Do you want people to help dig through archives to answer the mystery? Do you want them to see their different worldviews? Or as here, we want them to vote. This project is called Faceless Book. It's a documentary and it's an, we don't know what to call it, it's not really a game and it's not an, an interactive world either, we actually don't know. We just know that the documentary tells a very strong story about a young girl in a refugee camp. And then normally you would do a game. So first we talked about kind of survive 24 hours in a refugee camp. But first of all, I wouldn't play that game. And secondly, that's not what we want people to feel. We want them to understand with the documentary, this is a personal story, this is what it's like. But with the interactive, we want them to make a change and we also want to tell them more complex stories about refugee camps. We want them to understand what it's like as a camp leader, what it's like as a guard, what it's like people living close to it. And the only goal is to get young Italians to actually vote for politicians that want to have refugee camps in Italy. That's our only goal. And we got a very interesting way of publishing. We have a newspaper. 
Italian's biggest web newspaper, who has a million hits a week, they are a publisher for the interactive. And can we just convert a small percentage of that? We'll have so many people experiencing in this. So, in my opinion, traditional broadcasters and then actually newspapers who made it online and NGOs are your biggest channels for this kind of projects. Because a lot of people do beautiful projects and they're out there, but nobody reaches them and nobody finds them. So we really, really interesting to see where does this work relationship with hooking up with a publisher. And I have to say that in Norway, newspaper has start commission short factuals. So it is starting uh, and it's, it's so exciting. Um, okay, guys, I think, uh, yeah, thank you. And I just have to say, this is one of our very first things because we're doing something new for the media application here in 14 days. So everything is being reworked. So it's just a short, short footage, uh, just actually to kind of show uh, how chaotic it is also. And it's pretty heavy, so let's see how the web one works day. on it. You're going to work. Yeah, it's going to stop a bit. But this is all about kind of what happens. You go to work, it's a normal day, suddenly your like house gets bombs, everything and changes, your family's not there when you come home. Your country. You know, boys, I think they got it, and this is a bit slow. Your city's being bombed. So let's just move back. You get uh, to the office and the office is gone. You're I think what's really difficult with this project is uh, there was someone who said to me yesterday, uh, one of the biggest documentary uh, sales and distributors uh, in Europe, they said, we don't really like, you know, this serious, serious projects because nobody wants to see them. I think it's so important with things where you want to have people change and feel to find out how do you do it without just making this at them. Uh, so we're really looking forward to this project to see what we're going to do. What we know we want to go do is we're not going to let people play a refugee, but we let them follow different persons and tracking down their wills. And we also know that we really want to base this on the documentary. We also want to have the feel of being there, but more actually like if you were a documentarist and you were a camera, a fly on the wall, so this is like you would never be able to get inside here. We want you to get inside. When you're there, we want you to follow different people with, which paths cross. And then you, you either stay with this person, you go with someone else. And in the end, we want you to understand the complexity about refugee camps and political situations around it. Because that's very difficult to do in the documentary. Or we chosen to do other parts of the story in the documentary. So as you hear with these projects, very much about what do you actually want the transmedia to do? I normally say to people, this is not magic. I don't wave a wand and then you sell double as much or you do the best marketing career, uh, marketing project. You have to find out what you want to do with it. Why is it important? And sometimes you don't need transmedia and other times it would help or enhance either in getting people to change or in opening your story creatively or to market it also. I would. So, Jason. I wanted one of your projects. Come on, baby. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, very quickly, Asta asked me to show this project. It's um, called Fire Bryce, and it's the story of an Aboriginal storyteller and his stories and the importance of storytelling in today's world. And when we began the project, we thought it looked sort of like that, with a linear documentary as the lead piece backed up by a, an archive of web videos of Aboriginal stories made by the storyteller and the users. And what we've been doing is working iteratively, and we've been pushing the project on over the last couple of months. Um, we ran crowdfunding campaigns, we've been putting material out on Facebook, Twitter, Vimeo, we've got a channel running there. And what we started to do was look at the data, and I'm not going to read all of that at you, but we just started to look at what are people really doing with the material we're releasing? What is the feedback that we're getting? And we started to see that there was a real um, fondness for the material, but the material was actually that people were really engaging with was more the Aboriginal stories themselves than the story of the storyteller's life. And so 
what we are now starting to do is think about what Asta was just saying about what do we want people to do? What do we want them to feel? And what we want them to really do is engage with the stories and storytelling. And so we're in the process now, right, literally as we speak, of looking back at this structure and thinking about how do we turn it around? How do we lead with the stories down here and then have the documentary follow that? And that's um, an example of what I would call iterative development in the transmedia space. And that's iterating both the story and the technology at the same time in line with what the audience are telling us. And I think that's one of the real keys in the space is to work live with the audience. Um, and I'm going to show you one other case study. This isn't something I've worked on, um, but it's something that a colleague of mine just released in, at Sundance this year. It's called Hunger in LA. And um, this is one where they really thought through how can we immerse the audience in a situation that we couldn't do straight ahead as a film. And it came out of um, a larger piece of work looking at the food shortage that's happening in California. And Nani de la Pena, who's the producer, was outraged by this because California is one of the biggest food producing states in the America. It's one of the richest states. And yet you see food lines like this outside of food banks all of the time. And her and some of the other journalists she worked with had been out at the food lines um, one day doing audio recording, doing typical journalism. But something happened. The food bank ran out of food. And these people were left outside not knowing what to do. And one of the guys went into a diabetic coma right in front of them, and they had the recording of this. But just, showing the sa just playing the sound back to people wasn't going to be the most powerful way of doing it. And they thought really innovatively, how can we use technology? How can we immerse the audience in this? And they came up with what is not a mainstream solution, but is what has proved to be very powerful. And I'll show you. Um, that's Nani. And she's wearing a set of goggles that her and her team made that you experience the documentary through. So they actually immerse you in the 3D world of being in the food line when the food runs out and the guy goes into the diabetic coma right in front of you. And at Sundance, they had people being reduced to tears as they were witnessing this experience around them because they became so sympathetic to the situation. So it was a very different way of telling the story. Um, and it does require custom hardware. So again, it's not completely mainstream right now, but it just shows the power of thinking about what is the best technology to create the emotional effect and to tell the story as powerfully as possible as you can. And that ties in with, with the work that Asta has been doing. But also what I think you said, Jason, that it's not about the technology, it comes after. It's the same old, what type of story, what do you want people to feel? We just have possibilities today to differentiate it and make more of it and do it on more platforms. So I see things emerging. I've seen now enough interactive documentaries or enough uh, projects that can start seeing that there are type of experiences people are making that seems to be effective. And we have to go on. So I'll just say, if you want these slides afterwards, come and get my email, I'll send them to you. But basically, there's a being there and Hong and LA is very much that. Be there, feel it, where you try to do by digital as much sense you can, both on web doing huge worlds, uh, but also physical. Then there's this perspective of the you from above, where you're able to see something more than a normal human could see by this project. Then there's a journey, which has been the most used, which comes a lot from Canada and the popcorn platforms that, by the way, is open source, so you can go out and make a demo on it. Uh, or you could call Mozilla, the browser, and say, hey, we got a project. Lots of possibilities there, where you kind of choose your road and journey through the material, but it's already made. And then there are testimonials and tributes. And if any of you love Johnny Cash, go in and search on the Johnny Cash project. There's collaborative art project out there, the users are doing, which actually is kind of digital tombstone that's been so popular. It's so simple, hasn't cost very much, and it's very, very beautiful and effective. And then you have the investigator, as we had in the Ghost Rockets, where the role of the audience is actually to go and help you find out something, gather data, gather stories, help create the script. Then we also have the snack break, where people just want to do a little bit of things, but it's not too hard to do, not too long time, like we do a quiz or check Facebook. It's also effective. Okay. And luckily, we are out of the build so your own huge 3D game on Xbox, which doesn't work. So Jason, 
I'm going to stop now. Yeah, we need to just move yeah, on to Anna. Yeah, we need to, to move on. I just want to say that we can see that creatively we have to change our modes. We have to break four lies that's been controlling how we develop. One is actually, uh, what can you say, it must be social. It doesn't need to be. It can be a deep personal experiences. The other one are stop creating in time, start creating in attention. That's what's going to work. And then also, it's okay that there are different types of experience for the audience. And in the end, and Anna will talk about this, we have to stop thinking we must know everything and check out everything. We have to produce modular. Now I've used more than my time, so Anna. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and this is Anna from Boost, and she's going to tell you more about the talent development program and look at this from the human and talent perspective as well. Yeah. Uh, you can have the first slide, how do I get it to start? You just yeah, push it. Yeah. Well, I'm Anna Youngmark and I'm, uh, as you said, Jason, uh, I work with documentary filmmaking mainly as a project developer for 15 years. Done other stuff as well, but now I'm the founder and the managing director of Boost, which is, as you said, a talent development program, but not really. It's more of a platform. Uh, Okay, maybe I should stand like this because I like to wave my hands. Okay, it's more of a platform for innovation and talent development within film, cross-media and transmedia. And I also want to say that talent development is a hard word because uh, it, it makes you think about young people. And when you talk about cross-media and transmedia, everyone is a beginner. Like, for instance, Ove, who's sitting down there, he's in our program. He's well-established within the documentary film world. Uh, he's got a project. And also what we've been doing for these last three years is actually trying out, because when we started we didn't know anything, and that's the, the point we, we all start. And we've been doing programs, we've been doing labs, when we throw people in in the design process and uh, mix up their brains. We had workshop seminars and we also consult projects. So, let's move on. Uh, Asta, you talked about, and you raised the question, the advantages from you know being from the documentary world and uh, we got some great answers here and I will repeat some of them and hopefully give you some new things. Uh, since documentary filmmakers are very passionate people with a true urge to change, that is at least my, my uh, experience, uh, more platforms and interactivity creates a bigger impact as it says here and it cre that creates change. So that's a great op opportunity because I think one of the problems has been having this format and then you watch the film and then you've got all these you know, kind of rage or happiness or whatever emotion that is created. And you can get a website, but you don't really, you know, how, how do I take this further? How can I, you know, move on to another space? And by doing a transmitter project, you get this chance and you also get a chance to build a community around the subject that you want to raise. And also it's the thing with theme a theme from a real life. And having that, you always, you have people that has been, you know, have had experience from this, or they're experts in this, and they've got a hobby around it. And those people you can use to create this audience, which is very crucial in transmedia. And also, and I mean, you mentioned this, Asta, it's the archives, you've got a lot of extra real material, and in the best cases, you will have a an, uh, debate around it, you know, articles going through the newspapers. Like, for instance, around the film Bananas, I don't know if you know about it, Fred Gatton's movie, film. And also this thing can be used to, you know, create activities and to engage the audience. But it's not only the, all the things in real life, it's also the process, I think, one of you mentioned that, saying that it's an, a natural step for documentary filmmakers to enter the transmedia world. And since first, first of all, you know, the documentary filmmakers, they are, you know, in real life, but they also have a process where you try to foresee what will happen, follow tracks. Um, you also had a fragmented kind of process, a uh, production process. This can easily be translated into the, the, a working model for transmedia. And, but also, it can be used in creating activities for engaging the audience. And of course, advantages like new financing models uh, and distributing models, you mentioned a few in your, in your uh, 
speech. So, what does documentary filmmakers have to do? How many of you here is involved in a transmedia project or has done a transmedia project? So I know, yeah, thanks. That's, that's one of the things, you know, with transmedia, you have to know your audience. It's also, you know, coming from the culture industry, it's a, a bit of a new thing uh, that you focus on them first. So the first thing you have to do, um, these steps are things that I've seen during my years at Boost, and I've seen everyone, including myself, go through them. The first is to have a kind of an identity shift, where as a filmmaker, you're very focused on your format. And the format, the film in this case, is very, very important, finalizing that and having a special visual style and the content and everything. What you do uh, is that in transmedia, you take a step back and you look at your intention instead. I can't do a step back here because then you won't hear me. <laughs> Come back again. And you go back to the intention, the goal of the project, as you mentioned. And by doing that, you let the kind of mission, the intention decide what platforms or what medias you should use instead of beginning in the other end, choosing a format and then put uh, the subject into it. I think you will recognize this, but doing a film, a documentary film, I mean, you put a lot of effort in, you know, having the material and, and choose the parts you want to, you know, select instead of looking at it as a whole and see what you can do with all the different parts. Um, yeah, then you also have the multiple platforms, uh, of course. And by that you have to have, you have to understand your strengths and your uh, weaknesses and what you can and what you can't. And then you have to get used to a bigger team and also being equal in that team, saying that it will be more producers involved and therefore you have to, you know, deal with this. <coughs> Audience, getting back to that, interactivity, everyone knows that transmedia has got interactivity. Uh, it's the other way around, making a transmedia project. Instead of having the finalized film, you have the intention and you have your vision and then you start to co-create. You, you know, reach out with your project and then you co-create your project with others instead of having your own vision. And finally, to be able to do this, you have to be able to try out things, which means that you can't, you know, think and think and think and process, process, process and choose the people that you do this with. You have to, you know, really get out there and try bits and parts and see what works and then also measure it afterwards. What happened here? Okay. Now we'll move on to the process of ghost rockets, just to tell you how, they, how the development can be done. They began as a small film. They wanted to be small, nationally financed, um, for a national audience, nothing more by that. They had some distribution thoughts that they would put, you know, with the, with the finalized product, you know, like a website where they could put extra material on and, you know, stuff like that. But then they started to do research and they discovered that there's a huge community out there. And they thought, mm hmm, maybe we should use this in some way. But they were still just thinking about, you know, the marketing distribution kind of way, classic way. And then they went to actually one of our labs, but also a lot of other stuff that you, I mean, all festivals have got this right now. And then they found out maybe we should, you know, what is this with audience? Maybe we should create something. And at this time, uh, it was very, everyone was talking about games and games being the new thing. Uh, so here's actually what they did. They, start, they found out that they should do a UFO academy. And you see, you see the cards here on the, they started to hand out this. Because if you went through that game, you will actually have, be a certified investigator for UFOs. A perfect idea took a lot of time in developing until they understood that this won't work. I mean, why should anyone go to our homepage and play this game? It isn't linked to anything. They hadn't thought you know, about the audience, they hadn't thought about how things should be connected. And transmedia is a lot about communication and getting this thing rolling about. Uh, so what they did was that they went back and they really studied their audience, tried to find it, tried to find their main target, tried to understand that part. And they also looked very close at their assets, which was of the film, of course, the archive, 
uh, the uh, extra material, stuff like that. And then they made a plan, a strategy. And the strategy was at this time to make everything about the mystery, you know, the lake, the mission going to the lake, doing this. So they had this Facebook page with a mystery where they, you know, just put out like, oh, now we got a diver suit here, nothing more. And the same thing on the homepage. And nothing, but nothing happened. It didn't work. Can you understand why it didn't work? Just putting out a mystery? Anyone's got a clue? Because the audience, there isn't an audience that wants to solve the mystery yet. Exactly. They haven't, you know, you have to have understand what platform you're on or what playground you're on. So that didn't work either. Um, and then they understood one thing that I think is very important, and that is that to get an audience, you have to be extremely active. It's not only having a strategy in your head on how to do things. You really, really have to be active. You have to be out on blogs, you have to visit organizations, you have to be active on Facebook, you have to make people talk about you. You have to make friends. It's the same thing we do every day, it's the same thing we do on this festival. But doing this, it's a problem. I mean, if you're just a couple of people, I mean, where do you get time? So then they came to this conclusion that they had to extend their team. And they did with voluntary workers and also with Asta, for instance, as an expert. And since then, things have really been moving forward. And you told about that, where you are right now and stuff like that. And they're really in a positive phase. What I wanted to tell you this is because things are not like smooth, a strategy, and then you do it. Things go back and forth all the time. And you try things out and things work and it doesn't. But the thing is, every time a thing doesn't work, you understand more about what works. And that's the important thing here. So, this is the end, and it's kind of a summary of what we all have been saying or trying to tell you. It's the challenges, because it's a lot of fun being in this industry. I'm one of those who's really gone through being a total documentary nerd until being a total transmedia nerd. But there are challenges. Of course, the new working models, managing tools, structures, all about that. Uh, sticking to the goal and the intention and not, you know, getting back to the concept. It's a real hard cookie. Research, understand, and follow your audience. This is key, key, keywords, and also one of the harder things to do because you used to, you know, get your vision through do the film that you want to give to people. And then it's uh, things like who finds the right team. I mean, normally in, in the film industry, we meet, you know, in festivals, we know each other, or someone knows or we meet at bars, you know, after the screenings and stuff like that. It doesn't work here, because we're on different platforms, we're in different industries, so you actually have to think, at, do research around this, so you get the right game company, or the right uh, web designer, or designer. And then it's the editorial rights, because you will come in a situation where there are different producers. And it's very, very important, I've seen this mess a number of projects up, the situation where people are just working together and you haven't done any kind of hierarchy. I mean, who's the decision maker in the end? Who's owning the project? This is, you know, you're not a bunch of friends who's doing this. It's a big, big project. It's a lot of fun, but you also have to, you know, have, be very clear on this. And of course, the long development phase, uh, you know all about this already. Uh, this is even worse, but it's fun. And it's also, hard to predict the outcome. You can't promise things to people. And this is very linked to financing and distribution, which is, uh, yeah, it's hard to finance development. And also the ways of the structures today around financing is very linked to format. But this is changing. So uh, this is all I'm going to say. And now I'll leave. OK, Anna, thank you yeah. very much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, and if you want to have any uh, further conversation with us, we'll be over in the Meet the Speakers corner at the end of the room. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>